welcome Alan Finneger and his Take the ABC train. <laughs> Thanks, Betsy. Thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. I really appreciate it. So anyway, I'm Alan Fenninger. Um, I grew up in Maple Heights, Ohio. Don't hold that against me. Um, I, 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 I do have some friends here from Maple Heights tonight, so let's pick up sides and, and see where we can go. Um, but I, I just want to thank you for uh, setting aside some time uh, this, this evening. I know it's holiday season and, and joining me for this. Um, I hope it's informative and uh, I hope it's uh, somewhat entertaining. So we're going to start off with a riddle, a railroad riddle. So uh, here's the question. Which railroad of the past was made up primarily of employees with no ambition at all? Anybody? Just shout out the answer if you know it. Anybody? B and O. B and O. No. Wherever you work. Okay. New York Central. There's a prize if you get it right. No. One more. Little Sandusky. No. Sorry. Pennsylvania. No. I guess I'm gonna have to give you the answer. It's the Lackawanna. <laughs> all right. We're here all weekend, folks. Don't forget to tell your friends and neighbors, and don't forget to tip your servers. They work real hard to make sure you're having a nice time. So, so with that, now that I got you warmed up, um, my first slide is a thank you slide. Um, no, no historian or researcher ever does what they do alone. And these usually come in at the end and people rush through them. So we're not going to do it that way tonight. So if you'll bear with me, my first is I want to thank the Bedford Historical Society Museum, Jack Draga, Betsy Squires Lee, and Paul Poyman. You folks have been great since we've started this thing back in, in June. I really, really appreciate all the help you've given me. Um, next is the Maple Heights Historical Society, Heather Gaiacanese. He Heather, are you here tonight? I'm here. Heather, thank you so much. <laughs> Heather, Heather came out on a wet July <laughs> evening um, and, uh, and helped me with some things. It's in fact, Heather, one of, one of some of the stuff you gave me is one of the first slides. So thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Uh, next is the Northern Ohio Railway Museum in Seville, Paul, uh, Walt Stoner. Uh, if you're not familiar with this museum, it's fantastic. They've got about 44 um, old trolleys and inner urbans, three of which I believe are running now. Um, it's not two. Well, there was two, but they were working on a third one last night. Uh, last, do you remember? Yes. Okay, so am I. But uh, <laughs> when I was there in October, they were hoping to get the third one going. Um, Walt's been doing this for 56 years. It's, it's a labor of love, and uh, it, it's a treasure, and not a lot of people know about it. And it's open again in May, so put it on your calendar. Uh, next is the Central Electric Rail Finance Association in Chicago. They've given me some help. And now that I've got a member in the audience, I really got to be careful what I'm saying tonight. Make sure I'm really accurate because if, it, if it's wrong. <laughs> um, Cleveland Public Library with the uh, Plain Dealer Archives and uh, Cuyahoga County Public Library with uh, the Cleveland Press Archives. I spent hours on these archives and uh, got a lot of great information out of them. Uh, James Ebert, uh, also a native of uh, Maple Heights. James was thinking about coming up tonight. He lives in Dayton. James, are you? Are you? I, I've never met him in person. Um, but if it wasn't for James, he's a retired professor at Wright State. I would have never been able to identify all of the stop numbers, which is how this whole thing started. And we'll get to that in, in a couple of minutes here. Um, Brian Abrams, um, who was the caretaker at Moreland Mansion in, in Lakeland Community College, and. Uh, Jeff Dross, sitting back here, he's my best friend, and uh, also a graduate of Maple Heights, and he drives around with me uh, tracing some of these things. And finally, my wife, Lynn, uh, who is sitting next to Jeff, who uh, joins me on these wild goose chases and usually does it without question or reservation, usually. So, so bibliography and images. I have a sheet up front here uh, that lists all the publications and uh, outline or the uh, online uh, sources that I used uh, for the presentation tonight. Um, there's too many to mention, but I, you know, I did want to mention the Dick Squire uh, Bedford books. Uh, there's two books from uh, the uh, Central Electric Railroaders Association um, with the ABC and the NOTL, and then the Harry Christensen books. Um, Harry Christensen was a writer, a transit writer for the uh, Cleveland News. News went out of business in 1960. And uh, he knew and forgot more about transit than most people will ever know. And he's got some fantastic books. He's gone now. Um, but they're great resources. All of the images, uh, the black and white images, most of them are from the museum here. Uh, the color, I don't claim ownership to any of those. They're probably copyrighted. 
Uh, the color images are all mine. So how this all came about, Heather, you'll recognize this picture. <laughs> so, Dunham Road Bridge. The old Dunham Road Bridge in Maple Heights. Uh, this was built in 1911, demolished in 1983. This is Maple Town Shopping Center up in the upper left-hand corner. Stop down. Thank you. That was next. <laughs> Boy. She gets the prize. She gets the, no, she gets to do the rest of the presentation. <laughs> um, people, I've got to be careful, people of my parents' generation, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> called the area Stop 10, and it drove people like me crazy because we're going to Mapletown. No, we're going to Stop 10. It was Stop 10 on the old ABC interurban line, and that's what got this whole thing going. Um, the original Stop 10 was actually in the intersection of Broadway and, and Libby Roads. The ABC line originally ran down Broadway all the way to Bedford. Um, after the bridge was built, or in 1925 rather, um, they moved the line to a private right-of-way that joined with the uh, Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroad tracks here. And the stop was actually right under this first section of bridge. And there was a stairway up to the bridge, so you had to walk down, you had to walk up. It'd never make it with all the uh, the regulations that we have today, but uh, that was what was there. Um, and actually, there's a Bedford connection to this bridge. Um, it was built by McMyler Interstate, so that was up at Stop 27 on uh, Northfield Road. So Stop 27 meets Stop 10 here in Maple Heights. So, and this is all from a display at the uh, Maple Heights Historical Society. Okay, so what we're going to discuss tonight, the brief history of interurbans, somewhat less brief history of the ABC and its successor lines, the ABC route in Cuyahoga County and stops in Bedford and Bedford Township and Maple Heights. And I'm going to use Bedford Township and Maple Heights interchangeably. Um, it wasn't Maple Heights until 1915. Before that, it was part of Bedford Township. And actually, it was Walton Hills was still part of Bedford Township. Um, Major accidents in Bedford and Maple Heights. I had more, um, but uh, due to time, I kept it with the major ones. What remains today? This was, uh, this was the fun part for me, finding the things that are still out there. And uh, there's more out there than I thought. And there's only one request I have. If you have questions, please ask. But if I'm talking about something that you know is still out there, please don't say it, because that, hopefully that will come at the end. If I miss it, then tell me, OK? That would help. Um, and finally, one-offs, if, if time allows. And it's just little, little snippets, little things we've found. Um, the other thing that I'm going to use interchangeably is ABC and NOTL. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain that. But it was only the ABC exclusively for a few years. Um, the line ran from Cleveland through Bedford to Akron, or vice versa, however you want to look at it. And then mergers started taking place and acquisitions started taking place. So ABC remained a division of what became, for more than 20 years, of the Northern Ohio Traction and Light Company. Now, it had more names after that, but those are the two primary names. So you know what I'm talking about when I go through there. So, so with that, let's see if this, this sound works this time. <coughs> So let's set the stage. Let's go back 128 years here to December 8th, 1895. That was a Sunday. The building that we're standing in, or that we're sitting in, I'm standing <laughs> right now, uh, it was only three years old. This was built in 1892. And I checked the cornerstone earlier last week. Um, it was a good year if you had Cleveland in your name. Grover Cleveland was the president of the United States. He was serving his uh, second term as president of the United States. The city of Cleveland was uh, the tenth largest city at the beginning of uh, the decade, and by the decade's end, it was the eighth largest city in the United States. Cleveland had a world champion in professional sports that year for the first time, the Cleveland Spiders. The National League team, 12, team, 12 teams in the league. They finished second, and the second place and the first place teams faced off each other in a playoff, and Cleveland beat Baltimore. So. That was the year of the first automobile race in the United States. It took place in Illinois from Chicago to Evanston, 54 miles round trip. Six vehicles entered. Anybody care to guess how long that race took? Two days. No, a little shorter than that. 
eight hours. 54 miles in eight hours. The point here is the roads were bad, there weren't many roads, and there weren't many cars, okay? So what do you need? You need things like inner urbans. People in Bedford were probably still buzzing about this because that inner urban line had only opened about a month and a half prior to this. So let's back up a little bit. What was an inner urban? Now, I want you to remember this car, 1519, because you're gonna see it again later in the presentation. Um, the car was built in Cleveland, actually. And uh, it was after 1926 when they re redid the 1500 series um, on the ABC line. This was one of the fancier cars. So interurban means between cities in Latin. Americans were ready to travel. As I said, there's few, there were few reliable roads. The automobile was in its infancy. Uh, travel and deliveries were made primarily by horse and buggy. Think of how wonderful the world smelled back then. Mm -hmm. Now, cities had streetcars, so you get around on streetcars. Very few people had, had much more than that. Steam passenger railroads were there, but they were fairly inefficient if they had to stop less than five miles apart. So the inner urban kind of filled the gap on that. It was a streetcar in the city. It could be a high-speed passenger and or freight train on the rural private way, uh, private right-of-ways, and uh, these things could go up to 70 miles an hour if, you know, if, if they had the room and the time, or the, uh, the straightaway to do it. So, who used them? Now, this is another cool picture. This is the longest train the ABC ever ran. In October 1920, nine cars. Anybody guess why October 1920 was, yes? Yeah, it's a World Series. World Series. <laughs> Three days from Akron to Cleveland, a nine-car train rolled through Bedford on Broadway right out here. The only thing is when they got to the Cleveland line, which happened to be um, miles east 93rd, they had to split it up into three because the city streets weren't built to handle something nine cars long. So anyway, who used them? Um, just a short list here. Farmers loved the interurbans. Uh, got their goods to market quickly. They were out in the country. In fact, farmers, the U.S. was still an agrarian, agrarian economy until after World War I. Um, farmers bought stock in interurbans. Some of them did very well with this. Some of them donated land for private right-of-way because that meant they were coming right through the farm so they could pick up. Um, citizens, you could travel freely. I mean, if you live in Bedford, you can go downtown, you can go shopping, entertainment, um, and that's where local merchants in places like Bedford came up with things like hometown discounts because they didn't want you going to downtown Cleveland. They wanted you to stay home and shop here uh, for businessmen. So it made it easier for them to visit places like McMiler or Marble Chair or Taylor Chair. Uh, they could come to Bedford from Akron, they could come to Bedford from, from wherever they were coming from. Um, made it easier to travel, uh, to work in the cities. So if, if you lived in Garfield Heights, well, it was Newburgh Township at the time. Um, but if you lived in that area, you now had a way to get to work if you got a, if you got a job at Marble Chair in Bedford, instead of taking a horse and buggy, which would have taken forever most likely. Um, and one more thing, entertainment. So interurbans owned amusement parks, and they called them trolley parks. Mm -hmm. So they needed people to ride these things on weekends. So the ABC owned parks and picnic areas such as Silver Lake, Wyoga Lake, Brady Lake, just to name a few. And one other thing, people could come to Bedford Glens to come dancing on the, on the weekends. So it, it worked both ways. So how did they operate? This, I believe, is a is an NOTL freight car. Interurban lines produce electricity. They needed electricity to run the via, to run the cars. They called them cars. They called them motors. Um, so they had coal burning power plants, and they sold that to some of the cities on the route. So Akron, Canton were all lit by ABC slash NOTL power plants. They ran express trains known as limiteds, and these were trains that made few stops. So, but Bedford was a stop on the limited from Akron to Cleveland. Um, then they had local trains that didn't necessarily stop at all the stops if they didn't have to. Um, there were, I believe, 29 stops between East 93rd Street in Cleveland and uh, um, the county line um, 
Sagamore Road was the last stop in Bedford at the time, or Bedford Township. Um, but they didn't have to stop at all those stops. If there was nobody there, just like a RTA bus today, they'd just drive right by. And what they had was flag stops. So you'd wave them, wave at the motorman. If you heard the two toots on the horn, he saw you, you, you could safely you know, get over there and, and jump on the train. And it was the same thing. If you wanted to get off somewhere, they weren't necessarily really picky about it. Um, in fact, you'll see later, <laughs> there were two half stops in Maple Heights. So they were stops some of the time, but not all of the time. So. Where did they operate? Uh, this was pretty much a nationwide thing for about 30, 35 years. Um, but flat terrain was a real plus. So the Midwest was the capital of interurbans in America. And Ohio had more interurban trackage than any other state. In fact, almost 1,000 miles more than Indiana, which was, a close, which was the second. Um, this is a map of the uh, interurban lines that ran in northern Ohio. And I'm going to start on the west side. So this is the Lakeshore Electric that ran to Toledo, the Cleveland Southwestern um, that ran to Columbus and then through Medina, Mansfield. Actually, this goes by the Northern Ohio uh, Railway Museum. Um, the trackage is right there near it. The NOTL, which was what we're talking about tonight. Cleveland Painesville Eastern to Ashtabula, and the Cleveland Eastern and Eastern to Chardon and Garrettsville and then the uh, Cleveland and Chagrin Falls. And that went out Kinsman Road from, uh, from downtown Cleveland. A lot of people ask if uh, the Shaker Rapid was an interurban line. It was not. Um, it was originally, it was built by the, the Van Swearingen's as, as the Shaker Rapid. That, that one you're mentioning, that Lander Circle, they got a thing right in the circle that was part of the old interurban. Right, yes. It was probably part of that. I'm sure it was. I, I don't know for sure, but it, it makes sense when you say it. It's just like University Circle was a trolley turnaround. Um, now, the, the, the cool thing about this is they didn't end in Ashtabula. They didn't end in Toledo. You could pick up another interurban in Toledo and go to Chicago. In fact, you could take interurbans from New York City all the way to Chicago. It might take you a few days. You could get there faster on a steam train, but that's how extensive these lines were. They were everywhere. Were they comfortable? If you were on this car, you would be really comfortable. This was the owner's car from the NOTL ABC. This was like a private jet today. This is how this thing was laid out. Now, this was car number 1500. This was the second one. The first one was the Josephine, and that one burned in a, in a, in a car barn fire. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about this car later as well. So the early cars were made out of wood. They later got somewhat bigger, safer, and ironically strong, or lighter with aluminum or steel construction. They were about 50 to 60 feet long. Um, passenger compartments, some had uh, a combination for freight. Um, smoking and non-smoking sections, electric heat. Some had lavatory facilities. You know, you were going a long way. Uh, that original ride from Cleveland to Akron was two and a half hours. And uh, some were really pretty fancy with, you know, special art glass and padded seats and carpeting. Were they safe? Usually. <laughs> <laughs> um, the biggest danger in an urban was single track operation. Um, between major cities out in the rural areas, it didn't make sense to lay two tracks. It was expensive. You had to run trolley, you the wire up above and all that sort of thing. So they had single track operation. Now, to do that, you had to keep in constant communication. So motormen and conductors would get out of the train at a certain stop and they would either telephone into a dispatcher or get a note from a dispatcher at that stop to say, okay, you need to pull over onto a siding here. You're a local, the limited's coming through. You have to wait there until the limited passes by. If you didn't, uh, <laughs> Miscommunication led to accidents. You know, you can hear things the wrong way. I said this, but you didn't hear it quite that way. And especially on single track blind curves, two, meeting, two cars meeting head on could be disastrous. And that's exactly what happened in this picture. This was the most deadly interurban accident ever in Kingsland, Indiana, near Fort Wayne in 1910. 41 people lost their lives. So we'll talk a little bit later about some major accidents that took place in Bedford and Maple Heights. Nothing this bad. Okay, so the ABC was started, it was the first interurban owned by this syndicate. And five of those six interurbans, by the way, that I showed you from uh, Northern Ohio, they had their hands in, uh, in, in, those, in those companies. Um, 
these fellows own street rail railway companies and interurbans across the Midwest and Canada. Um, they were the largest interurban syndicate. They sold, individu they sold individual stocks from their companies on uh, the stock exchange. If you live in Bedford and you like the NOTL, you could buy stock in it. Um, Henry Everett was the son of a Cleveland investment banker. He was the idea man. He was ahead of his time in a lot of ways. Um, he was actually a good person to work for. He came up with a pension plan for his employees well before most companies ever thought about him pension plans. Edward Moore was from Dover. He was a self-made man who joined the, his, this Mr. Everett's uh, father's investment banking firm as an office boy. He worked his way up in that and other companies, and he was basically the firm's money man. Um, he wasn't a very good money man in 1902, though, because <laughs> um, they called it the Great Embarrassment. Um, they, they, they couldn't pay their bills, basically. Um, it curtailed their ability to expand greatly, and uh, they really never got back on track as far as being as aggressive as they once were. They, 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 maintained, they, they managed that company until 1916 when an uh, East Coast holding company bought it. But again, the early days were the heady days for this company. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Mr. Moore later, especially. So the Akron, Bedford, and Cleveland launch. Uh, this is probably one of the earliest pictures I found at the Historical Society here. Um, it was Mark Broadway and Willis, but the weird thing about it is there's only one track, and they ran two tracks through the, cities of th through the city of Bedford. So I'm thinking this may, the line may have still been under construction when this picture was taken. I don't know. Um, it's, it's kind of a grainy picture, but that's just speculation. The initial operation began from Cuyahoga Falls to Bedford in September of 1895. By mid-November, that line was reaching Miles Avenue. Um, you'd have to transfer there to the Cleveland Railway Company, which the Everett Moore Syndicate all, also owned. Um, it wasn't a municipal line yet. Um, it was under private ownership. And by uh, the middle of uh, September, you could travel all the way to Public Square. Um, this was the first interurban in Ohio and one of the first in the nation. It was originally 35 and a half miles long, Cleveland to Akron, and in its heyday in 1920, it had 398 miles of track. That's how much expansion they did. A lot of expansion south of Akron, a little bit east, and a little bit west. Before I move forward on, on the company, though, I wanted to talk a little bit about Be the Bedford operations, because it comes into play later. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is Bedford Cemetery right here. Here's the curve in Bedford, in, in, in Broadway, which was called Main Street at the time. This area was the ABC operations in town. They had a small car barn, for, it, kept, it uh, held four cars, it wasn't meant to hold things or repair things for very long. A small coal burning power plant, um, both the car barn and the plant went away as early as 1913, and they were certainly gone by 1918. Uh, there was a turnaround right here, uh, they called them WYE, W-Y-E, and a substation, and that regulated power to East 93rd Street and to the Summit Line, and the uh, Summit County Line. The important thing about that is there was a trestle right here from Broadway that went up to Northfield Road. It's a six and a half percent grade. It doesn't sound like much, but that's, that's, a, tough, that's a tough pull. Now, because it was right at the substation, they were getting full power. That made things a little bit easier. Pull the, the pull the other way was up Union Street, up to where the railroad tracks cross. That was uh, the Wheeling and uh, Lake Erie Railroad here at uh, Broadway and uh, Union. That was a tough pull too, but again, you're getting full power from your substation at that point. You're gonna hear a lot, a lot more about some of the operations later, but I just kinda wanted to establish where things were here in town. So, as I mentioned, it wasn't the Akron and Bedford, Cleveland, Akron and Bedford and Cleveland for long. Um, this was the original letterhead, by the way, uh, which, was, which I took a picture of from the museum here. This is from 1897. The original offices were at 616, uh, in the Gar 616 Garfield Building, which was East, east 6th and uh, Euclid downtown. Um, between 1899 and 1902, there were several iterations of the name Northern Ohio Traction and Light. Um, and ABC then became a division. So you'll, you'll learn more there. The more, as I said, the more uh, ownership, uh, it, it took cars all the way to Canton, Dover, and Eurexville. The Everett Moore ownership lasted again until 1916. 
Um, it became Northern Ohio Power and Light in 1926, and you're gonna see a trend starting here. The power end of the business was becoming the main part of the business. Um, uh, the automobile was starting to take over, ridership was going down. Um, there wasn't much time left for most interurbans at that point. Um, became Ohio Edison in 1928, kind of a little more marketable name. And today, Ohio Edison's a division of First Energy. So First Energy can trace its beginnings roundaboutly all the way back to the ABC. Um, it, there's, a, there's a huge family tree involved here, but it, it's there. So as I said, folks who lived on the ABC division still referred to it as such. These are all employment ads that appeared in the Plain Dealer in the, in the teens, the 20s, and the 30s. So here you have Lemco products, which happen to be in Maple Heights. It says stop 10, it's on Dunham Road, it's a bit of a walk. But uh, here you have Bedford, uh, Bedford Restaurant, Bedford, Ohio, stop 21. They didn't list addresses, they listed their stops. You were supposed to know that. Uh, McMiler Interstate, stop 27, as I said. Taylor Chair, stop 24. I have a list of all the stops later, so I know I'm jumping around here. Stop 22 was uh, Marble Chair. Same thing when you wanted fun. Orchard Lake Park. This was probably the closest to Bedford of any of the parks that I found on the ABC, but it wasn't owned by the ABC. It was a private amusement park. It was a Route 303 and Route 8, and I think that was, that was Stop 62. I haven't gotten all the stops down for Summit County yet, but um, it opened in 1927. It opened kind of late. And the last reference to this park in the Plain Dealer was 1933, so I have to assume it went out of business. And there's probably two reasons. One was the Depression, and two, this line went out of business in 1932. So there was no way to get there unless you had a car. Mm -hmm. The Maple Heights Jockey Club. Anybody know about the Maple Heights racetrack over at Rockside and uh, Broadway? Nin stories of it. I do. Yeah, 1921 to 1927. It was a triangular track. And uh, this was stop 14 and a half. <laughs> so if you needed to go to the jockey track, it was a stop that day. If not, I like this one for Bedford Glens. It's, uh, it doesn't say the stop, but uh, you didn't need. If, as long as you got to Bedford, you know where Bedford Glens were. Mm -hmm. So, yes? Was that a horse track? Uh, uh, was that a horse track or a car? Horse. Horse. Track. First Ohio Derby was held there in 19... Right. First Ohio Derby was held there in 1924. Yeah. So. They had stables over there. Like, uh, and then Bedford Fire, I thought they were escaping. Oh. There was a fire there. I knew that yeah, at one point. Yeah, they were chasing the horses down through town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the track was half in Bedford and half in Maple Heights, so I guess if the cops raided it on one side, they could all move to the other side or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, then there's some smaller businesses here. W.A. Betts at stop 13. Um, Maple Heights Lumber, I can't read the, the stop number on that. But, uh, 14 and 14, 14, oh, it must, it was near the racetrack, so that's, that's where they got the lumber to build the racetrack. So. So this was the system, and I don't know how well that map shows up. It, it was a vertical system, and it's a horizontal presentation here. Um, but it reached points as far as Warren, Alliance, Wadsworth, and Eurexville, and here's a list of some of the places you could visit if you rode the ABC or the NOTL. Um, they they like to play up the fact that it was clean, so it wasn't cinders coming out from the steam railroad or anything like that. It was electric, so there was none of that. Um, safe, eh, most of the time. Um, it was a good way to go. So a little bit of trivia. Anybody have an idea of how much it cost to ride from Cleveland to Bedford or vice versa in 1895? 20 cents. 20, you're close, 25. 25. Well, when you think about it, it was. That's, that's good because an 18... Used to cost me 35 cents to go to downtown from... But an, 18, an 1895, I'm sorry, it was 15 cents one way. I'm sorry, it was, that, was, that was the round trip. That was the round trip. But regardless, so Cleveland to Akron, 60 cents one way, a dollar round trip. But an 1895 dollar, I looked this up, has $36 worth of buying power today. So you were paying $36 mm -hmm. if you were doing a round trip. And people had 
salaries less than a thousand dollars at that time average wise um, now you could get you could travel cheaper they had what they called commutation tickets so they had extensive freight operations so uh, downtown Cleveland the freight terminal was located on the site of what's now the parking garage behind the bleachers at Progressive Field um, the NOTL probably had more of a freight operation than most inner urbans have uh, had from from what I've read um, so that was important to their income. It was innovative. Um, the owners also owned a telephone company. So they were the first inner urban to use the telephone to call ahead to find out where the trains were online rather than you know have slips of paper handed to them or something like that. There was a dispatcher at the junction in Silver Lake. I'm sorry, you have a question? Yeah, uh, did they also use it for mail? Yes, they did. Yes. Mail yeah, they transferred mail on, on those. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a closed circuit tele, uh, telephone system, so uh, it was it was ahead of its time. Accidents. Uh, I keep coming back to that. This line had more than a chair, um, but they were smaller. Now, there's no accident that's small, and I understand that. Um, the worst accident was in 1918 in Cuyahoga Falls. A car derailed, fell off of a bridge, and went into the Cuyahoga River Gorge. It killed four people. Now, <clears throat> here's one that not a lot of people know about. In 1906, they wanted to move the line off of Broadway in Bedford and take it to a private line. And the city of Bedford went crazy. And they said, there's no way. You've got a franchise agreement with the city. You cannot move this line. It was still being discussed, and then the panic of 1907 hit. Now, none of us remember the panic of 1907, <laughs> but all of us remember, remember the Depression. This was the second worst financial uh, setback for the United States in the 20th century. And it really set the country back for, ten, or for three years, rather, through 1910. And not a lot of things were, were being built or happening, and certainly the line wasn't doing a lot of projects. They had things planned including this, but that never, it never moved off of Broadway in Bedford. It moved off of Broadway later. The reason they wanted to move it, by the way, <laughs> not because they didn't like Bedford, they just wanted to travel faster. Uh, that was the whole thing, getting people there faster. So. Okay, so I told you they held up on some projects and uh, they finally got to do some things in the teens. This was the powerhouse in Cuyahoga Falls and this thing was huge. Now what this did Unfortunately, it was it killed the powerhouse in Bedford. They didn't need it here anymore because they had enough power coming out of Cuyahoga Falls. So after 1913, there was no more powerhouse here. 1912, I'm sorry, it opened in December. Um, this was June 1913. There was a seven mile cutoff from Northfield Road um, from Fell Lake to Route 303. This was a double track, East Coast style electric railroad design along the new Northfield Road. So the old line went across, went, went down old Route 8, okay? It went through what we know as the village of Northfield. This one moved it up to the village of Macedonia. That hurt Northfield. It was to your advantage to have, you know, the inner urban coming through there. But this thing could move. I mean, this thing, this is when they got up to their top speeds. And it was considered to be the finest piece of inner urban trackage in the country. As I said, originally it was an hour, it was two and a half hours. This took it down to 90 minutes to Akron. Um, what was their top speed? They could get to 70, but I don't think they did much more than 50 or 60. I mean, I wasn't there, but that's it. <laughs> my dad might have been, though. My dad grew up in Maple Heights in the 20s. I'd like, I'd like to think that my dad rode this thing at one point. I really would. So. Um, and they finally got to build what they called the Great Traction Terminal and headquarters in Akron, Ohio. Um, this replaced their storefront operations in Akron. It, was, uh, it became their headquarters. It was a four-story building. It was the hub of all their rail operations because everything was moving through Akron, to the north to Cleveland, to the south to Eurexville, Dover, to east to Kent, Ravenna, um, west to Wadsworth. There was an adjoining train shed and car barn. There were 32 trains an hour coming in and out of this terminal. So this was a big deal. This was literally like a train station. So the Cleveland through Bedford route, we're going to start in downtown Cleveland from Public Square. Um, they moved it off of Public Square in 1924 to a temporary building in, uh, on Prospect Avenue. I think the building may still be there, but I can't confirm it. The plan was initially, it was, was finally to put this, to let them go in where the Shaker Rapid went into the Terminal Tower, but they, they were gone by the time anything like that could happen. 
Regardless, it moves southeast along Broadway to East 93rd on the old Cleveland Railway tracks, streetcar tracks. Then it joined the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks just south of Calvary Cemetery and moved past Garfield Park. From there, it moved on to Broadway at White House Crossing. Does anybody know who, what, what White House Crossing is? Okay, so remember, anybody remember the sand pits down off of Broadway? Okay, so that's White House Crossing up on the bridge there. Right by the quarry. Right by the quarry, that's exactly what it is. It's called White House because White House cement was based there. Okay. That was a dangerous crossing. It, uh, the, in fact, the interurban stop there was called Dead Man's Crossing. There were so many accidents because the Pennsylvania Railroad crossed double tracks there. That's where the interurban crossed single track. Um, and then it was the Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroad. So you had five tracks at grade right there. And you had wagons coming across and then later on automobiles. There were a lot of deaths. Anywhere from, from what I read in the Plain Dealer, they built the bridge finally in 1930 that, that took everything up over what that was, but I found anywhere from two dozen to 80 deaths over the years at that crossing. So it was single track operation all the way through what became Maple Heights to Leonard Street in Bedford. Anybody, Leonard Street, yes? Yep. Okay, near Harrison. Uh, when, bus garage is, uh, bus garage in there. Okay, when they moved the line off of Broadway in Newburgh Township, Garfield Heights, Maple Heights in 1925 to a private right of way. They finally got that part off of Broadway. Um, and again, that's where it came up behind Maple Town where Stop 10 was moved and all that sort of thing. Um, it came out back onto Broadway here in Bedford between Leonard and Harrison Streets. And there was a small freight operation um, on, on, those, on that block as well. Uh, as again, it was a double track operation through Bedford to the substation across from Bedford Cemetery across Tinker's Creek on that 365 foot trestle, going uphill if you're going to Akron. Um, stop 26 was on the corner, at the corner of Union and uh, Northfield. I don't know if it was at the corner where the billboard is up there, or if it was Cata Corner where Immaculate Conception School was. It was up there, <laughs> that's all I can tell you. And the reason I don't know exactly where, I, I have a feeling that it was where the billboard is, um, closer to the Broadway side because at, at one point that's correct because that's in my backyard where the billboard was yes okay because at one point the and you'll see a picture the, the stop actually had a hut and I think that's where the motorman came out to get his orders because it was a single track on, on the bridge well so, the pylons for the old trestle are still there you weren't supposed to say that <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can skip one slide. Okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just, just teasing you. That's okay. No, that's good. I did not know that where that was. Because actually the story that made me wonder where that was, was he got out of the train one time to call and make whatever, you know, find out what was coming. And I guess he didn't put it in what we would consider to be park. And it slid down the bridge all on its own. <laughs> uh, nobody got hurt, but uh, it happened. Didn't have it the right notch. Nope, nope. Didn't set the air brakes, I guess. And it traveled on the east side of Northfield to Sagamore Road, and that was the last station in Bedford, or Bedford Township. So here were the stops. And this, this again, this was my quest. This is how this whole thing started, starting with stop 10. So what was in Maple Heights? Um, no big surprises here, except remember stop eight and stop nine. So stop nine is Greenhurst. It's also called Dunham on some maps, uh, because if you kept taking Dunham straight across, it would have become that. Um, I don't know why there was a stop eight other than the fact that they had a siding between these two. And they needed to have a siding before they hit the Cleveland line again. Um, unfortunately, it was on a blind curve and it was single track. So you know what's coming. Um, we have stop 11 and a half at Broadway School. Um, Sterling, stop 14, this was also the site of Osborne Farm and the Osbournes had a well right there and the motorman used to get out and cool themselves off with a nice drink of water. It's where the Jack and Heinz plant was. Um, I think 14 and 14 and a half, or 14 and a half and Rockside could technically be in Bedford, but they fit better on this slide, so that's where they are. So 14 and a half is the jockey, the jockey club. These are the stops in Bedford, um, with a caveat that I'm not sure about Grand. Um, I can't find this on any, plat I can't find stop 16 on any plat maps. Uh, for some reason, it went off the map. Um, this is the logical spot for where that would be between Rockside and Leonard, but I can't say that it is the spot. Um, any surprises here? 
You know Bedford better than I do. Stop 25 was called the bridge stop. That's where the substation was. Then Union and Northfield, and we've confirmed that that was where the billboard was. McMyler Interstate, Ward's Crossing. Remember Ward's Crossing, that's gonna come up later. Um, and then Sagamore. Actually, Alexander didn't go all the way up to Northfield Road until I don't know when, but it wasn't on any of the plat maps that I saw. Um, <clears throat> from what I was told, most of these didn't have signs, but we did find two. So this is a picture of Grace Street, the Grace Street stop. Now, if you look right here, you're gonna see a sign. <laughs> stop 19. <laughs> There we go. And then Columbus Street, this was the September 1913 homecoming. If you look right here, you're gonna see stop 20. 20. So we, we were surprised, but here's the stop up the hill. So this is stop 26, Union and Northfield. And we've already answered the question, so we can move through that one. So local accidents. Uh, it wasn't in business very long uh, before things started coming apart. This is the Bedford Trestle, uh, the original Bedford Trestle, in January 1896. Now, if you do the math, that's about three or four months after it opened. Um, this is a 6% grade, as we said, from the substation in the car barn. A work train was coming from Cuyahoga Falls to deliver coal to the uh, power plant, and it was being pushed by a snowplow, and obviously it was too heavy for the bridge and uh, it fell into Tinker's Creek below. A brakeman and the conductor were killed. Uh, the motorman survived. Now here's the weird part, and this is from the Dick, one of the Dick Squire books about Bedford. Um, the bridge builder was ruled at fault, but ironically, they were selected to rebuild the bridge. <laughs> um, and Jeff and I were speculating about this when we were, and we figured there's just not that many companies around that could do that back then. So, you know, you had to have that. They took responsibility for it. I'm sure there were lawsuits, but nothing like today. Um, they had a temporary wooden structure up within 10 days, and the, the new bridge was completed in just over a month after that. Um, sad part is a laborer on the new bridge died too, so there are actually three deaths out of this accident. Um, oh, and there's the new bridge. I'm sorry, I didn't click in time. So. Ward's Crossing. This is where the railroad overpass is on Northfield Road today. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't there then, and the ABC and the Cleveland and Pittsburgh Railroad crossed it, an X there. Um, this probably had the potential to be the worst accident in the company's history. Um, fortunately, most of the train, the express train that hit it, <laughs> Most of, the, most of the inner urban car was across, so it got hit in the rear, but it was still destroyed. Um, the conductor from the inner urban got out to check things, throw the switch. He saw a slow moving freight train coming through, let that go by. I guess he must have figured that was the only train coming through and that must have gone off onto a siding because there was another train right behind it coming fast. And the conductor jumped back on the inner urban, uh, gave the motorman the all clear to go, and whammo, they got, they got nailed. I mean, you can see, you can, it's not a good picture, but it was destroyed. Um, 17 people injured, um, all were in the ABC car, but one. Uh, somehow nobody died, although the, although the Plain Dealer article, Plain Dealer articles were great back then. <laughs> what do you mean back then? <laughs> These people were fatally injured, okay? But the next day, they showed change for the better. <laughs> so were they fatally injured? I guess not, you know? So, but it's amazing though that nobody died in that crash. It's it just, I mean, just to look at the decimation. This is the Maple Heights, and I told you remember to remember the eight, stops eight and nine. Um, it made front page news on the day that the uh, New York Giants won the world championship, by the way, um, which is why I put the whole thing in there. Um, but 50 people were injured in this. The, as I said, the, the, there was a motorman taking a local north uh, who had pulled off. Uh, he was given instructions to wait for probably two trains coming the other way, and he only waited for one train. And when that happens, you pull out and you get nailed. The sad thing is the driver of the express train, who, or the motorman from the express train, who was actually where he was supposed to be, was the one that was killed. So Now, there were, there were many more accidents, and there were several fatalities in both Maple Heights and Bedford, but you know we're, we're going long here. So, um, so Late 20s, interurbans across the country are clinging to life. Um, people still wanted the freedom that they wanted in 1895 that the interurbans gave them, but by now they wanted automobiles. 
and roads were doing better. There were shipping by truck, made it cheaper and faster. In many cases, it was door to door. Um, bus service from Akron to Cleveland actually began in 1919. Um, the NOTL was still strong in freight at that time, but then the Depression hit in 1929, and that decimated their freight business. Um, so they dropped the freight business as of July 1st, 1931. We knew that things weren't going to last much longer at that point. In January, the headline is the Akron Limited doomed, and in February, suburbs that were Bedford, Northfield, and Boston Heights were complaining about the potential abandonment, abandonment that was going to come. Um, you know, electric railways are expensive to maintain. Track, um, overhead wires, uh, motors. Um, you can't move the tracks once they're there. Uh, buses can go anywhere they want. And uh, it wasn't so much the bus. And I, I actually read the, the uh, action that the line took to close, and the ABC was the last part of the NOTL, by the way, that, that kept running. Um, and th they said it wasn't as much the buses as it was the cars. People wanted cars, and that's what they were doing. Advertising didn't help either. I mean, you know, everybody was, you know, they wanted the Ford, they wanted the Chevy, that was the thing. So here we are at the end of the line. Outside of the Bedford Theater, supposedly taken on March 31st, 1932, which was the last day that these cars ran through Bedford, Ohio. Um, now, we did some searching on this, and it wasn't. We wanted to confirm that this was really the last day. So the movie up here that was running was called Surrender. Um, that was introduced in December 1931, so makes sense. There was a movie that was coming called Emma, and the first time that showed in Cleveland was uh, February 14th. The sad part is, this theater didn't really belong to any bigger theater group. So the Plain Dealer only listed theaters that were showing, that were in Cleveland. The press was a little bit more liberal, um, but you had to belong to some certain motion picture association. So the Bedford Theater wasn't listed in there. So either they didn't care or they just, they were, they were too cheap to be a part of it. I don't know. Um, but anyway, this theater was at 580 Broadway between Grace and Columbus. And, uh, Is it still well? No. no, no, this is before that. This was between Grace and Columbus. I mean, did they rename it the Stillwell? No, 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 just a different theater. Okay. I don't know when oh. one died and one started, but I think Stillwell started in 1948, yes. 41. What year, I'm sorry. Nineteen ten. Six? Sixty six? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting tired up here, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it wasn't over yet though. So the Cleveland Railway, which was was by then a municipal line, decided that they were gonna try to save service from Bedford to Cleveland and they used old Shaker Rapid cars to run from Cleveland to Bedford through April 10th of that year, 1932. And it just wasn't getting the ridership, and they shut it down. So that was the end of it. So, but that's not the end of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite part. So this is what's left. Um, there's still a lot of things out there that you can trace back to the ABC line. So this was the Garfield building downtown that I took uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, where their original headquarters was at East 6th and, uh, and uh, Euclid. And uh, it's now an apartment building, but it's still there. So I mentioned the Moreland Mansion in Mentor. So Mr. Moore and Mr. Everett, like many Cleveland millionaires, wanted to flaunt their success. And a lot of them, a lot of them built summer homes in Lake County. Most of them were in Wycliffe. Um, but these two bought a farm in Mentor so they could be neighbors. But they were neighbors three miles apart. <laughs> so this was Mr. Moore's home. Mr. Everett's home was where the Kirtland Country Club uh, clubhouse is today. It's no longer there, it burned down. The second home they built there burned down. The one that's there is there, but it's not the real one. This is still there. And uh, Jeff and I drove out there, I think it was early October, and we were lucky enough to run into Brian Abrams, who was the caretaker who let us inside. And I uh, didn't expect that. And uh, 
it's, it's in great shape. Uh, the family lived, Moore died in 1928. The family lived there until 1982. This is part of Lakeland Community College. It's used for special events. The upstairs are offices. Uh, it's, it's just beautifully restored. This is a painting of Mr. Moore in the foyer. And that staircase, I mean, you know, take your wedding picture there. Anybody recognize this building? Bedford Ticket Office. We're not far from it. Anybody remember Castaway Coolis? That was the Bedford Ticket Office. It was Walter Day's confectionery shop back in the day. And supposedly there was a safe in that building marked NOTL. So I don't know if it's, the, anybody have access to this building? I'd, lo I'd love to get in there and see if that safe is still there. But, uh, but buy tickets there. I'm sure that's where the motorman stopped to get, you know, information and that sort of thing. So the substation, this, this was a fun one. Lynn and I drove over here one day uh, in September. This is down the street from Pawnee Lanes, um, or what's, what was Pawnee Lanes, 1000 Broadway Avenue. This is what's left of that whole operation. And the reason I know it's real is we, were around the, we went around the back. And you see that up there? Now let me give you a close up. <laughs> those, those are insulators. And I did a close up of the one, and it's from the Locke Insulator Manufacturing Company. That building went out of, that, that company went out of business in 1932. So this has to be that original building. I just thought that was so cool. Oh, yeah. It doesn't take much for me. <laughs> the Bedford Bridge foot, well, we, we know those are already there, so. <laughs> Um, the bridge came down in 1932. It, it, you know what? They didn't even give this line a chance to come back. They took that bridge down not long after the line went down. Even if they wanted to reopen this thing, they would have had to build a new bridge or go up Union Street. So the footers are still there. Um, it's easier to see them in the fall when there's no leaves. If you line yours, if you, if you go down that Metro Parks roadway, and by the way, the roadway actually goes over where the old creek bed was. They moved the creek bed. Um, so. Where the roadway is is where the train fell into, actually, back in 1896. Um, if you line yourself up with a driveway coming from uh, the water department on Broadway, you'll see this footer on that side of the road. So you can see it right there, just, just the stone. And on the other side, it's a little harder. It's up the hill, and it's, halfway, it's, it's buried halfway. And then, of course, this is where the train went, where, where, it, where it ended up upstairs or up on Northfield, rather. So, the Macedonia substation. Um, this was a stop on the, the new cutoff line, and lo and behold, it is still there. And uh, it says it was built in 1905, which I don't get, because that, that line didn't go through there until 1913, but if that's what they say, okay. Um, <laughs> it's, still, it's still part of uh, First Energy, by the way. They still use it. And, uh, Walt Stoner at the, at the museum, by the way, said that they wanted to take this down a couple years ago and it didn't happen, so. Um, they're still part of the operation in Cuyahoga Falls. This was where most of the operation was before they built the headquarters in Akron. And uh, this is now a restaurant in Cuyahoga Falls. It's called the Divine Restaurant, 2752. Just to the right of it is where the new Route 8 freeway goes through. So you can see why most of that stuff is probably gone. Well, most of it was probably gone anyway, but. This is still there, it's nice to know. Now, the museum. I told you to remember cars 1519 and 1515. This was so cool. We got down there this year and Walt told me these cars were there and I just, I couldn't believe it. They're, you know, they're not in the best of shape. Are they ever gonna run again? Probably not. You know, <laughs> you're looking at something that need parts that's over 100 years old. Uh, I believe this is 1515. There's 1519 as a close up. I just, that, you know, get goosebumps seeing you can touch these things from, from that long ago. Uh, the old Northern Ohio logo. And then I climbed up on something and took a picture inside and you can see there's, there's really no roof on the one and there's, <coughs> there's no floor, but they're there and you can touch them. And car 1500, that executive car that I told you about, is supposed to be at a museum in Connecticut. And I contacted these guys three times and they wouldn't respond to me, and I just, you know, I finally gave up. I hope it's still there. Um, I can't believe it's in much better shape, but. Uh, Is that one the RTA heavy rail behind it? Blue and, looks like it's blue and gray or blue. Yes, yeah. it's running. <laughs> They've got, yeah, it's one of the two that are running, so. So, this is another fun one. 
the Calvary Cemetery spur. So uh, the ABC didn't have funeral cars, but the Cleveland Railway did. And this is an old um, ABC combine car. Again, they were sister companies. So this is where they put the caskets. I don't know why they needed four, but you're not going to do four, four funerals at the same time. Um, but this would go to various cemeteries. Um, you could rent this out, and there was, a, there was a smaller one, or there was one with only one, I guess, because they finally figured out four was too many. Um, but one of the spurs went into Calvary Cemetery. And because the ABC used that same track at that area, they could use that loop as a turnaround or as a, uh, a holding area for cars that had to run the next day for, for resting the night of. Um, the work cars used to do a turnaround in there. And I did a Google search on that line, or a Google Earth, Earth search, rather, and lo and behold, I saw a railroad track. And I'm thinking, oh, come on, it can't still be there. Folks, it's there. This thing wasn't, it was stopped, they stopped using this in 1927. And it's still there. It's between, if you want to go to Calvary Cemetery, it's between sections 11 and 13, and it's right along the border. It's, it's just neat to see. Okay, so the station in Akron. This is the interior. I love the, I love the spittoon down here, by the way. That's, that's, <laughs> so there's the train shed. And as of 2019, all of this was still there. Um, this is the building. Uh, it's been, they added two floors. Uh, you can see the NOTL logo that was built into it. Mm -hmm. This was where the train shed was, and it's gone now. This was supposed to become a corporate headquarters, and they wanted to put another building back behind it, so they took the old train shed down in 2020, or 2019 rather, and then the pandemic hit. And the company that was going to make this their corporate headquarters um, said, no, we don't need the space anymore. So. Uh, Part of history is gone, but the building itself is still there, so. Okay, now this one's my favorite. <laughs> um, the Kenmore Car Barns were their largest car barns on their system. Three brick buildings, they're built to last and they were built with style. These are Dutch gable roofs. Um, these were popular in Holland in the 1700s. I mean, these guys, you know, they weren't skimping back then. It could house 72 cars, 20 cars in the shop, 47 on the outside tracks, and uh, it eventually, once the trains were gone, it became the garages and repair buildings for Akron's trolley buses. Uh, sadly, it's also the place where most of the NOTL's cars were scrapped. So they were burned and dis dis disassembled in the, in the lots next door. It's still there. It is still there. I couldn't believe this. Lynn and I were driving down there and it's like, oh my gosh. Um, there's still the numbers, the ceramic numbers above the, uh, the doors. Um, it's supposed to be a polymer company, but it looks abandoned. I don't know. But the, um, the substation next door is still there. It's still being used by, uh, well, Ohio Edison First Energy. So kids, that's all I have. Um, I say happy rails to you instead of trails to you. Uh, thank you. So this, this is actually a picture that I took behind the Bedford Historical Society uh, on my first visit here, and I just wanted to use this quote because it's too good a quote not to use with this picture. Remember Yogi Berra? You know, Yogi didn't always make a lot of sense, but I like this one. <laughs> when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> so that's what I did. Question, yes? Yeah, um, not so much a question, but you were confused about the uh, 1905 at the Macedonia substation and then 1913. Yes. Well, the tracks came down uh, New Northfield Road in 1913 to that substation. So that substation was there in 1905 because it was a spur. The spur ran behind oh, okay. old Route 8. Now then they were going to put a giant, when, when you said the Alexander Road didn't go through, yeah. it was true. Alexander Farm was a big area all the way down uh, past, and remember Route 82 wasn't there either. So that's where the, the spur would come down and the line would continue down to Akron. Well, as, as late as 1970, if you look at the bike trail, you can see there were areas there, they were going to put a giant um, housing development in there. And just after the Depression, it went bankrupt. And it was going to be another spur for the ABC line to pick up, you know, the residents that would be moving into that area there. And it never, it never got developed. You know, you bring up a good point, and I, I think I had it on one of my slides and I forgot to mention it. This was, this was huge for development, for real estate. Um, 
I found so many ads for the, the city of Bedford for some of the developments, and I don't know, they're, they're, some of the streets have, they're, they're, part, they're part of developments that I've never even heard of, but you know, back in the teens and 20s, that's when they started and stuff like that. Um, as I said, it was, a real, it was a real benefit to be on a line like this um, for residents. And Bedford was the second biggest city, or the third biggest city on that original ABC stretch, by the way, so that's why it was so important here. Yes? Uh, when you were at Lakeland, or um, more of a mansion. Did Brian take up on the second floor where he had all the pictures? No, no. Oh, he didn't? No. That's where he got all the pictures. They got rail cars. Oh, wow. Um, actually, he had Marlin built. We called it Marlin. Okay, yeah. He works as a policeman. Right. There. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And, Do you know Brian? No. Oh, okay. No, he, he, came he was supposed to be here tonight and he couldn't make it, so. But the, that further down uh, on, the, on the college grounds, he built a uh, house, they called it Camelot. Mm. And that was for one of his daughters or a, a relative, anyhow. And they have since torn that down. But mm. he had a, the mansion, it got, um, what do you call it? It gets uh, noticed that it's a historical yeah. building. It's a great place to hold a wedding or something like oh, that. Oh, it's got to be oh, fantastic. That, there were yeah. weddings, there yeah. were, uh, there were uh, parties, there, were, there was all kinds of things. Yeah, it's a cool place. So. Yeah. Yes, in the back? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, all these uh, inner urbans converged on Cleveland Public Square. Uh -huh. The Bainesville, the mm -hmm. St. This, this line or whatever. Uh, you showed a, a building that was on Prospect. Now, this is pre Terminal Tower, right? Was well, the Terminal Tower like 23? Yeah, but things were in the works. They moved them off the square in 24, and probably because that was starting and the, the, that, that work was starting. I just wondered where. You know. That's that triangular building on Prospect, right where it comes up toward 9th Street. Mm -hmm. I think that's the building. That's, that's the address, 814. Yeah. But no, I, th I think that's where it is. I, I, and again, I didn't include it in here because I couldn't confirm that that was the real building or not. But, uh, so that would be the yeah. but again, they were, the, the plan was to take the uh, private right of way all the way. It goes up 93rd a little bit, and they were going to take it in where the Shaker Rapid goes through Kingsbury Run. They were going to take it off Broadway completely at some point. Um, so, never just never happened. It'd be nice to still have it today, you know. Um, I'm sorry, you had a question. Oh. Yeah. Ron and I are friends, and we're volunteers at the Moreland Historical Garden. Oh wow. The Ryan, told us about your. Oh good. Well, thank you for coming. I'm I'm uh, flattered. Yeah, and it was Camelot was built for Margaret Moore Clark, one of the daughters, <coughs> the last descendant of the Moore family to live at Moreland mm. and sold it to the Lakeland. Yeah, we were just so happy that he let us in that day and stuff. I never, you know, I think he was kind of busy. It was the end of the season and stuff like that. I'd love to get back there and go upstairs. They call us, say, yeah, somebody prowling around. You know? Yeah, well, that's kind of what I thought, too. You know, two, two, two seedy-looking characters back here on the grounds and stuff like that. So, um, yes? So, uh, Taylor Chair and Marlon Chair were pretty critical stops. I mean, to draw, like, for them to have a stop right there. Place, you know, like must have been a lot of people coming in to see the operation there from other parts of the area. True. Bed Bedford was a key. Stopped. Bedford was a key place. You know, I didn't find anything from Bedford, China, though. So they either didn't advertise for for help with ABC or whatever. But I wasn't Walker. finding. Well, I know it became Walker, but I asked. I, I couldn't find anything with Walker, so I asked Paul Poyman here uh, from the museum. You know, what, what's going? on? He goes, Well, it was originally Bedford, China. So I went back with that. And I couldn't find anything there either. So they just obviously didn't advertise for ABC, with ABC. Isn't that so. actually off the of Solon Road? Uh, you got me there. I'm a Maple yeah, Heights yeah, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Solon, Road. Solon Road, yeah. <laughs> right, but that was the stop. What was the stop number? Um, it wasn't Solon Road. It wasn't called Solon Road, but there was another, there was another stop past there. there was no, that would be way too far for there. someone to walk. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Uh, the, the, Lem the Lemco ad for Maple Heights, yeah. Yeah. Stop 10 was on the east side of Ma east side, west side, Maple Heights. Yeah, yeah. I was an east sider. It was on the east side of Broadway. Yeah. Lemco was on the west side. That was a hike. You had to hike across that bridge to get yeah. over there. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't a hot skip and a hop skip and a jump. So, yeah. Yes? Whereabouts was Lemco? I had it and it there. Jeff? It's on Dunham. Uh, Really close, well, about a half a mile from the bridge. So where the bridge comes over, uh, uh, goes over the track? Yeah. At kind of mm -hmm. intersection. So go another, maybe about a half mile up. Mm -hmm. 
right near the service department. Mark? Yeah, you're right. Maple Heights Service Department. Oh, well, you know, it was kind of weird that all this dried up around here back in the 30s, yet Solon had a, uh, a depot street and, uh, over there, and they had a train station. And, and my uncle, who moved, moved there in 64, he took that train downtown to work. Uh, oh yeah, it, it ran through the 70s. I used to work at that shopping center out there and I used to go out when I was dumping, gar I was in college, you know, so I was working in one of the stores as a stock boy from Kent State and I'd go out there at night and I'm dumping garbage and I'd see the passenger train come through. It's like, wow, that's really that cool, was, you know? Uh, that went to Youngstown. Yeah, it went to Youngstown, yeah. And that was one of the eerie lack. <laughs> it, was a, it was the <laughs> Lackawanna. <laughs> no ambition whatsoever. There you go. Do we have... Time to just look at a few more trivia. Wait, one question. I just want, I just want to mention that uh, I, I sent you a photo a while back, but there's, the, there's still some original track out there now. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Neil Stevens, yes. I didn't see you, Neil. Yep. I'm sorry. At the Gordon Power Plant, there's also the footers are still in the river. Yeah, there's, there's got to be. There's got to be more out there too, yeah. and it's it's just fun looking, isn't it? Yeah. It's it, it's just it's just. Fun. I met Neil at the museum one day. He came in looking for somebody who knew something about ABC, and we talked for 20 minutes. So, <laughs> yes. The regular bus lines pretty much replaced a lot of this route. I mean, when they were they did, and you know what? The, the people that started the bus line in Bedford were NOTL stockholders because they knew what was coming. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'm happy to stick around and talk if you <laughs> let me let me let me let me do one more off this this one off list, okay? So anybody familiar with the term devil strip? Yeah. What is it? Tree line. Where? Africa. Yeah. Okay. Do you know the origin of the term devil strip came from uh, inner urbans? The devil strip was the space, four foot space between a two line track. That's where it came from. And because NOTL was based in Akron, the theory is that it just kind of stuck around down there and it evolved into this. But it's known in like a lot of communities where, where there were uh, um, inner urban lines or you know, the, the, the car barns and stuff like that. I never knew that until I got going on this. I knew about the devil strip, but I never knew it came from this. So thank you folks. Have a nice holiday. Be safe. Thank you.